All right, I think we'll kick off. Um, welcome to you all to Public Law Week. This is the first time Cornerstone Barristers have hosted a Public Law Week. And this week, we've got a whole series of events on various different topics in the public law sphere. Today's topic is on public law in the Supreme Court. Um, but you'll see when you look at our website that we had an event yesterday and there are other events taking place later this week. And so if you are interested in finding out a bit more, please do have a look at our website for our other events. Uh, you can see from the screen that the event's being recorded. And if you need to pop out at any point or want to look at the webinar again, it will be posted on our website probably later today, as will all the other recorded events. And so you can look at those in your leisure. The intention today is to use the Q&A function to ask questions and would encourage you to post any questions that you have in the Q&A function. Both um, I and the other speakers will do our best either to pick up those questions during the course of our talks or to um, spend some time at the end of this webinar answering your questions. So just to tell you a bit about ourselves, I'm Kuljit Bogle. I'm a member of the public law team here in Chambers and practice across all of Chambers practice areas, but have a particular interest in housing, um, licensing and court of protection work. And I'm joined by two speakers, Dr. Alex Williams and Dr. Sam Fowles. Alex is an experienced public lawyer with experience across various public law fields, including planning, social housing and licensing. His recent experience includes appearing in the Court of Appeal in the case of Crown and Blacker versus Chelmsford County Council on the principle of consistency in administrative decision-making. And he acts with County Council in the landmark case of Crown and Finch versus Surrey County Council on the issue of environmental impact assessment and net zero, which is due to be heard in the Supreme Court later this month. For several years before coming to the PAR, Alex was an academic, researching and publishing, as well as teaching in the field of public law and human rights. Also with us is Dr. Sam Fowles. Sam specialises in public and constitutional law and has acted in some of the most significant constitutional matters in recent years. He appeared in the Supreme Court in Miller versus the Prime Minister, in which the court overturned the government's prorogation of parliament and regularly appears in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, representing both claimants and defendants. Sam is Director of the Institute for Constitutional and Democratic Research and is Standing Counsel to the All-Party Parliamentary Group on the Constitution. He lectures in public law at Oxford and his recent book on um, constitutional developments was an Amazon bestseller, one of the Times Best Books of 2022. And so I'm going to kick off just to give you a bit of an overview as to what to expect during the course of today's webinar. Uh, you'll hear various phrases mentioned by both speakers, and I thought it would be useful just to flag at the outset how we're going to be using some of those phrases. But before we do, it's worth just looking at um, the reasons why we thought it'd be useful to have a seminar on this subject matter. And it, it's mainly been driven by the fact that there have been several Supreme Court judges over recent years that have retired, pr principally Lady Hale, but others as well. And Lord Reid became president of the UK Supreme Court in September of 2020, uh, 20, uh, forgive me, January of 2020. He'd been a justice since February of 2012, but he's now the most senior judge on the court. Uh, the court's currently made up of 11 women, 11 men and one woman, Lady Hale, uh, Lady Rose. And um, it's worth looking at the Supreme Court website to see that nearly all of them have at some point been ex educated at either Oxford or Cambridge, and they are all white. So we've um, got some way to go in terms of diversity and, and representation. Um, but uh, the change in personnel, and particularly Lord Reid being the president and the most senior judge, has, um, we would suggest, uh, uh, suggested an, a change in direction in the way in which the court has considered uh, matters of constitutional importance. And this seminar is going to be looking at what that means for all of us. In terms of the phrases uh, that you'll hear mentioned by the speakers, um, Dicean realists are intended to refer to the Hale and Bingham Court, uh, which um, took the view that it was important for the courts to hold the executive to account and um, took into account and placed value on the influence and relevance of international law. And that's to be contrasted by what we've described as the Dicean traditionalists, that, that, that namely the Reed Court, the current court, 
where uh, we would suggest that the court has taken the view that Parliament is the ultimate arbiter and not the courts. Um, that there's been less weight placed on the relevance of international law, and there's very much a, a more deferential attitude towards uh, the will of Parliament. And it's against that background and that um, uh, uh, labelling, as we've um, chosen to apply, that uh, our two speakers are going to be um, addressing these subjects. And so I'm going to hand over to Sam, uh, forgive me, Alex, who's going to be telling us about uh, the traditional Dicean framework. Thanks, Kuljit, and morning, everyone. So we'll talk to you about well, two, two main things. Um, the first, as Kuljit mentioned, is this Dicean framework and, and what we mean by that. Uh, and the second thing is a trio of House of Lords appellate committee cases that were decided um, a, a little while ago uh, when Lord Bingham was the uh, senior law lord. Um, and, and I do that in order to set the scene, really, for Sam's discussion. Um, which seeks to identify trends, changing trends, uh, in the way the apex court uh, in this country has dealt with um, uh, constitutional issues. Um, so the Dicean framework then uh, revolves around this chap, who's on the next slide, um, Albert Venn Dicey. Um, he is a, a Victorian scholar, um, born 1835, died 1922, uh, and his uh, work on the study of the law of the Constitution uh, is still today uh, regarded as highly significant. What he set out to do was to explain how, as he saw it, the Constitution operated. Um, and there are several themes that are associated with uh, traditional uh, Dicean uh, theory, uh, some of which Kuljic's mentioned, but I'll just expand on some of those. Um, the first theme really to come from Dicey's writing uh, is that parliamentary sovereignty is the bedrock of the constitution. Uh, parliament can make or unmake any law it wishes, uh, and nobody other than uh, parliament can set an act of parliament aside. Um, and what that shows really uh, is a strict separation of powers, certainly between the courts and the legislature, uh, but also between the government uh, and those other two organs of state. Uh, it follows in turn, uh, according to Dicey's view of the constitution, um, that statutory interpretation is heavily textual. Of course, the language of the statute always matters and it's a question of, of balance, but under Dicean theory, the courts wouldn't probe into the context of the statute uh, uh, and uh, adopt such a purposive interpretation of the statute as they now, uh, in more modern times, tend to do. Um, Dicey's work also placed heavy emphasis on the rule of law. Um, in its more thin rather than thick conceptions. Uh, and by that, I mean that to Dicey, the rule of law was fundamental. Um, the government uh, had to act under law uh, in order to act constitutionally. Um, but the content of that law was less important because of the emphasis on parliamentary sovereignty. So in other words, to Dicey, the rule of law was a rule of law, uh, not necessarily a rule of good law uh, or moral law. Um, and that thin, thick debate uh, has exercised scholars uh, certainly for a very long time. Uh, and once again, it is all a question of balance uh, uh, in terms of how we uh, conceive of the rule of law. But Dicey certainly conceived of it in its more thinner conception. Um, allied to that, Dicey was also concerned about the principle of equality before the law. To him, uh, that was fundamental. Law had to be applied equally regardless of uh, status uh, or rank uh, of the person or persons to whom it applied. Um, and in keeping with that idea, um, Dicey tended to compare um, uh, other systems uh, of law, in particular continental systems that had a more developed conception of administrative law, um, disfavourably to the uh, British constitution. I mean, his view, uh, uh, a developed system of administrative law uh, like that, for instance, in France, uh, with a separate system, uh, a court system, at least for administrative um, or challenges involving administrative bodies, uh, tended to jar with that principle um, that law should be applied equally uh, and that status and rank uh, shouldn't really factor. And finally, Dicey's work um, was associated with a stricter, uh, or, or very strict, in fact, dualism by which we mean that parliament uh, being uh, sovereign um, uh, has to give effect in domestic law to international law before international law becomes relevant. So he saw a very strict divide between law as it is enacted by parliament 
uh, and international law, which in his view didn't play uh, a significant role in our legal system. So with that canter through Dicean uh, principle, we come then to the three watermark Human Rights Act cases that I will discuss. Um, all of these cases were decided during Lord Bingham's tenure as the senior law lord. All of these cases uh, were decided by a panel of uh, judges that included Lord Bingham uh, and Baroness Hale. Um, and in my view, the Human Rights Act is, uh, or these three Human Rights Act cases, present good case studies um, because it's in the human rights context that we tend to see these uh, issues of balance between individual rights and sovereignty, for instance, uh, and between law and politics really coming into sharp focus. So they give an indication um, as to uh, the reasoning, certainly of, of the House of Lords Appellate Committee um, uh, around that time. The first case is A and the Home Secretary, um, also known as the Belmarsh Detainees case. Um, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the UK government had derogated from the right to liberty under Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, it did that by issuing a derogation under Article 15 of the Convention, um, and it enacted uh, the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act 2001, Section 23 of which allowed for the government to detain uh, non-nationals who were suspected of terrorism and who couldn't be deported. And in order to uh, produce a valid derogation under Article 15, it had to be shown, first of all, that there was a war or public emergency threatening the life of the nation, uh, secondly, that the measures adopted pursuant to that war or public emergency uh, were strictly necessary, given the circumstances of the situation. Uh, and thirdly, uh, that the government had complied with its other uh, obligations under international law. Um, and in this case, uh, at first instance, a special immigration appeals uh, tribunal um, had uh, found that a public emergency existed um, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Um, but that the government's measures under the 2001 Act were disproportionate. So it quashed the government's derogation order and it declared that Section 23 of the 2001 Act was incompatible with uh, Article 5 of the European Convention. The Court of Appeal allowed the Secretary of State's appeal um, and the House of Lords uh, overturned uh, the uh, Court of Appeal and restored the first instance decision. Now, for present purposes, um, the remarks of Lord Bingham and Baroness Hale are uh, very significant. Um, so on this question of public emergency under Article 15, Lord Bingham said that great weight had to be given to government and parliament on the question of whether a public emergency existed. Uh, that is a quintessentially political uh, decision, he said. However, when we get to the issue of strict necessity and whether these measures are strictly proportionate, the degree of deference that the executive should, should be given by the courts has to be conditioned by the nature of the decision. And he said that deference shouldn't preclude and doesn't preclude a review of proportionality by the courts here, especially given that the liberty of the individual is at stake. So in his view, if anything, the focus on individual rights, particularly the liberty of uh, the individual, uh, required, uh, if anything, more searching analysis on the proportionality front than it otherwise would have done. Baroness Hale's judgment was in similar terms. Um, she agreed with Lord Bingham uh, and the other judges uh, who um, decided to uh, declare section 23 incompatible. Um, for her, uh, it, only the courts can decide when or for how long to detain someone. Um, and uh, significantly, in, in her view, the concept of democracy and majoritarian rule, and of course it's that concept that under, uh, underlies sorry, parliamentary sovereignty, uh, can't prevail if the legislation that's produced is inconsistent with equal rights. And those very interesting remarks, um, in particular that final remark, does tend to suggest, in, in Baroness Hale's view, uh, a more uh, a thicker conception of the rule of law uh, than under Dicey's writing. Uh, what we see here is the courts toying with this idea of whether the law is good law uh, or not. So what are the headline points to take then from A and the Home Secretary? Um, the first is what we see is a robust protection of individual liberty in this case, uh, even in the face of clear legislation 
Um, there wasn't really any ambiguity uh, in that aspect of the 2001 Act. Uh, it was perfectly clear what Parliament was trying to do. But we see a robust analysis of proportionality, um, uh, of the proportionality of government measures. Despite the national security context, where the courts tend, uh, or at least tended, to give more deference to the executive, we still see a very intrusive um, uh, and robust proportionality analysis being carried out. And thirdly, um, a robust application as well of international law principles, uh, not simply those principles found in the European Convention, um, but also principles found in other treaties. Uh, and in particular, when the House of Lords was assessing this third limb of Article 15 of the Convention, uh, and was asking whether the government had complied with other uh, aspects of international law, uh, there was a very detailed analysis on various UN conventions, for instance, which suggested that the government uh, hadn't met that test. So we come on to the next case of uh, Ulla, um, ex parte Ulla. This case involved uh, asylum applications by non-nationals. Their applications had been rejected and they faced deportation. The question was whether it would breach Article 9 of the European Convention, uh, the right to freedom of religion, uh, to deport those people to countries where they were at risk of religious persecution. And one of the questions that the House of Lords had to grapple with is what it means under Section 2 of the Human Rights Act to, quote, take into account Strasbourg case law. Did it mean, for instance, considering Strasbourg case law uh, and then British courts making of it what they will, uh, or did it mean something stronger uh, akin to a duty to follow Strasbourg case law? Um, the House of Lords uh, took a view that tended to suggest that that obligation was at the stronger end of the spectrum. Um, in Lord Bingham's judgment, uh, with which Baroness Hale concurred, uh, only the Strasbourg court can correctly interpret the European Convention. It's an international instrument, and the Strasbourg Court is set up uh, in order to interpret that treaty. Um, it follows that national courts shouldn't therefore dilute or weaken the effect of Strasbourg case law uh, by taking different interpretations of it that result in lesser convention protection being given in domestic law than will be given by Strasbourg. Uh, and thirdly, it followed that under Section 2 of the Human Rights Act, it was the duty of national courts to keep pace with Strasbourg, uh, to offer no more protection, but certainly no less. So the headline points from this judgment then, um, we have three. The, uh, what we see in this judgment is a strong appreciation of the importance of the authority of the European court um, in terms of interpreting the convention. Um, and that's uh, an interesting point, because the convention itself, of course, is quite loosely drafted in terms of the, um, the uh, rights uh, that it gives rise to. Uh, the detail of what those rights require uh, is to be found more than anything in the case law that Strasbourg has decided, rather than the text of the convention itself. So what we see in other is strong focus being placed on that case law, which gives rise to the, the real content of rights. Um, what we see also is a, a more subsidiary role in the House of Lords view uh, for domestic courts on uh, interpreting the Convention. Um, Lord Bingham uh, also referred to the principle that the Convention is intended to be uniform in its meaning throughout its European contracting states, uh, and it would threaten that idea uh, if European countries could take divergent views of the same rights. Uh, and what we see thirdly, and it was this element of, of Allah that's received quite a lot of academic criticism over the years, uh, and, it, and perhaps even um, has been uh, departed from or softened slightly uh, in more recent years, is a reading up of this discretion under Section 2 of the Human Rights Act, uh, which requires the courts to take into account Strasbourg case law uh, into something which more closely resembles a duty to follow it. The third case is Weil and Birmingham City Council. This case concerned the provision uh, and the termination of residential care services by a private care provider who was acting on behalf of Birmingham City Council. And the uh, decision revolved around the issue of whether the private care provider was performing a function of a public nature under Section 63B of the Human Rights Act. 
so that it was bound to respect the European Convention uh, as a public authority. The House of Lords found by a bare majority, three to two, that the provider was not a public authority and wasn't therefore directly required to comply with the Convention. Um, dissenting, and we'll take the dissenting views first, um, Lord Bingham said the answer to this question is clear. Um, which is interesting because, of course, there's a, a bare, bare majority decision. Um, the answer, he said, is clear. There's no test to uh, what a public function is under Section 6 of the Human Rights Act, um, but Section 6 deserves a wide reading as a measure which is intended to give effect to the European Convention. In his view, Parliament wouldn't have intended to leave the residents of care homes unprotected. Um, what is meant by that is that in the contracting out situation where uh, a core public authority like a council passes a function to a private provider to exercise, uh, a rights gap arguably arises, because if the provider is not a public authority, then it means that uh, service users who are uh, provided the services on behalf of a council which has decided to contract out uh, are not protected against their provider, whereas a postcode lottery obviously arises uh, and those who are provided with in-house services do have convention address. Uh, and in Lord Bingham's view, uh, that would be iniquitous. Um, Parliament wouldn't have intended to leave residents of care homes unprotected in that situation. Um, also dissenting, uh, Baroness Hale's views uh, were in similar terms. Um, she said, what we have to do is look to the scheme of the Human Rights Act. And if we look to the white paper that was produced by the government ahead of the legislation being enacted, uh, we can see that the overall scheme of the act was for the government to provide, or through the courts, to provide remedies in domestic law uh, if the UK state would be liable in Strasbourg. And so in her view, the starting point had to be that where there is liability in Strasbourg, then in principle, there ought to be liability in domestic law. Um, she said various relevant factors, or sorry, various factors were relevant um, to working out what a public function is. And among these factors, uh, were whether the state had assumed responsibility to provide the function uh, and whether there was public funding underlying the function. And she said that the Human Rights Act, sorry, that the state had uh, assumed responsibility uh, in this case. Um, there is comprehensive uh, uh, legislation that deals with uh, the provision of residential care. Uh, it is a state function uh, and whether or not the state decides to contract out, uh, it has clearly assumed responsibility to provide that function. Similarly, uh, in this case, even though there was contracting out, uh, the service users' care was being funded largely by the council. And so to her, that public funding element was important. It pointed in favor of the function being public. She also said that there is a close connection here uh, between this service, the intimate nature of care service, uh, and the European Convention's core values, in particular, the dignity of the individual. Uh, plus as well the risk of convention rights being violated uh, in a care services setting. Uh, she said again those factors point in favour of, of this function being public uh, and the private provider being bound to respect the convention. The majority position was very different. Um, those judges in the majority uh, tended to focus much more on the technical nature of this arrangement. So in Lord Scott's view for instance, uh, for instance, this is a private arrangement. Um, it was a private provider uh, paying, or oh, sorry, being paid to provide care for a commercial fee. Um, in Lord Newberger's view, this wasn't even a case of contracting out. Uh, the statutory function that the council had to perform was to arrange to provide the accommodation, arrange to provide the accommodation, whereas the care provider was providing it. In his view, they, they were performing different functions. The, this wasn't a case of passing a, a function uh, to the private provider uh, and providing a service, or sorry, providing the same function um, uh, in a contracted out setting. Um, the majority also took the view that whereas a rights gap might arise um, uh, if uh, contracting out took place, um, there was also arbitrariness in uh, holding the private provider to convention standards. In particular, it would give better convention protection to residents of a care home who were 
uh, private care home, sorry, who were receiving contracted out services than it would to residents of a private care home who are paying for their own care. Um, and in the House of Lords view, or in the majority's view at least, uh, that was uh, also arbitrary. Um, ultimately, therefore, if Parliament want, wanted to widen European Convention to apply to private providers, whether in the contracting out setting uh, or otherwise, uh, then that was a job for Parliament to do. It wasn't for the courts to close that gap by interpreting Section 6 of the Human Rights Act in a way uh, that held the convention, uh, sorry, held the private provider to convention standards. Um, so what are the headline points from YL then? Um, well, as we've seen, the majority's position uh, was driven much more by the technical legal position. Uh, this was a contract, this was a commercial setting, it was a private company providing the services, uh, and the emphasis on uh, potentially disadvantaging um, privately funded users by uh, uh, bringing about a result that would mean they got less protection than um, contracted out service users would get. So for the, the majority, it was very much about not trespassing into uh, what was seen to be uh, Parliament and the government's decision-making territory. Uh, Lord Bingham and Baroness Hale uh, were driven much more by the position of the individual, however, uh, the need to protect the individual, uh, and were much more willing to look to the overall scheme of the Human Rights Act and the Convention to identify the values and duties that, in their view, should inform the interpretation of Section 6. Um, so that is a whistle-stop tour uh, of the kind of reasoning um, that we would see uh, in significant Human Rights Act cases uh, from the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords uh, during that period where Lord Bingham was senior law lord. Um, so in practical terms, how is this relevant? Well, obviously the common law is more than uh, the value set uh, of a particular judge or judges. Um, the whole point of the common law is to ensure that that is the case. Uh, but certainly marginal cases, uh, more difficult cases where the issues are more finely balanced, um, it does tend to show how judges uh, would balance the different competing values like individual rights and sovereignty uh, or law and politics uh, when the chips were really down. So possibly if this reasoning is typical um, of all courts and all judges, uh, then in those more difficult cases, what we might see, for instance, is a greater willingness on the court's part to uh, apply the proportionality doctrine robustly. Um, if you are uh, a social housing landlord, for instance, that might mean uh, uh, greater willingness to scrutinize the proportionality uh, of your behavior when evicting a tenant. Um, if you are, for instance, a planning decision maker, uh, it could mean uh, in more difficult cases that the courts are that bit more willing to uh, probe into a decision maker, uh, sorry, decision letter uh, or the um, officer reports uh, of a council planning officer than they otherwise would be uh, in order to uh, ascertain whether the behaviour is lawful. And it's those subtle messages that are being given off in that old case law um, that are, are significant. But the crucial question, of course, is, is this reasoning typical uh, of all judges uh, at all times uh, or might something else uh, be going on? And with that, I'll pass over to Sam uh, to talk to you about the more recent case law from the Supreme Court. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Um, so, what I want to, uh, want to talk about is, is bring the, bring our story up to the up to the present day, uh, moving on from the Bingham and Hale Court to the the Reed Court. Um, and I want to uh, to start off with a bit of an interesting st statistic. If uh, if I could just go over this slide, um, in its in its first three years, the Reed Court refused eighty percent of human rights claims. Uh, its predecessor, the Hale Court, was closer to sixty percent, and public bodies were twice as likely uh, to win uh, their claims than they were to to lose. Uh, whereas in uh, in the Hale under the Hale Court, it, was, it was, wasn't quite 50-50, but it was a little bit closer. Um, now, there are, of course, lots and lots of different possible explanations for this. It may simply be uh, that the cases that the Reed Court was, was faced with in its first, uh, first few years were just bad cases, uh, bad, bad claims. Um, but I think from, if you look at three of the Reed Court's key public law judgments, you do start to notice a distinct change of approach um, from its, its predecessors. Um, 
And this is why Alex uh, started off by telling you about Dicey, uh, because Dicey has always been considered sort of the, the doyen of the of British public, uh, public law. Um, but Dicey was uh, writing in the late 19th century. He was writing at a time before mass democracy, uh, before public international law, before judicial review, um, and before the, the modern conception of fundamental rights. And what his, uh, what successive uh, apex courts did in the, in the second half of the 20th century, beginning with Denning, um, Diplock was a, was a significant, uh, significant voice in this, and of course, uh, Bingham and Hale as, as perhaps the sort of, uh, the, the apotheosis of, uh, of this, um, was to take the essence of Dicey's conception of the Constitution and apply it to this new world in which everyone was allowed to vote. Uh, we were bound by uh, post-Second World War public international law. Um, we were, uh, and we were bound by fundamental rights, both in common law um, and in, uh, in human rights law. And what I think we've seen uh, in the Reed Court is a, uh, is a move away from this, uh, what, what I would call um, realism, the, re the realism of, of Hale and Bingham, towards a more traditionalist, traditionalist approach, applying the, the public law um, like we did in the late 19th century. Um, and there's three things, uh, three key uh, themes in that that I'd like to draw to your attention today. If we go over the slide again, um, the first is an increased deference to the executive and or public bodies. And so and it's important to distinguish between the executive and parliament. So the executive may sit in parliament, but it is not parliament. It's a separate body of government. It's not elected. Um, and uh, the, but it's the, it's the part of government that does the day-to-day -day business of governing, but it is not allowed to make law, uh, save with the explicit permission of parliament. And it's this body, the executive, what we often call the government, that the court has been much more deferential towards. Um, moreover, the court's no longer seen as the ultimate arbiter of rights or the arbiter of the, of the constitution. Um, and it is much less willing to take account of international standards. And I'll explain what I mean by that by looking at, at three cases. And these are going over to the next slide. Um, the first case is the case of uh, Begum and the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. The second is Friends of the Earth. And the third is a case called SC. Um, and before I dive into how these are significant, I just wanted to, to give you a bit of background on, on each case. Uh, the first case um, on the next slide, which you'll be, I think, probably most familiar with, is the case of Shamima Begum. Um, she was radicalized or groomed, whichever way you want to analyze it, as a child, and either ran away or was trafficked away to, to join ISIS. Um, when ISIS collapsed, she was detained um, by the Syrian Democratic uh, Forces, and her British nationality was terminated under Section 40 of the Nationality Act 1981. She was then refused, she appealed against this, but we refused leave to enter the UK to contest her appeal. Um, she challenged both uh, the deprivation of nationality and the leave to enter decision uh, before the Special Immigration Appeals Commission and was uh, and lost before that. Um, but she succeeded on her leave to enter appeal in the Court of Appeal. The next case is uh, the Friends of the Earth case, and this uh, concerns the third runway at Heathrow Airport. Um, it was actually a challenge to the what's called the airport's national policy statement. Um, and that is a state, statement that the, the, the 2008 Planning Act requires the Secretary of State to make, setting out what the Secretary of State wants to do um, about airports and uh, going forward. Now, the the basis of this challenge was that Section 5 of the Planning Act required the Secretary of State in making the statement to take account of existing government policy. Um, and Friends of the Earth said, well, that means the Secretary of State must have had to take into account 
the Paris Climate Accords of 2015. The Secretary of State said, I accept that I haven't taken those into account, but I also say I didn't need to. And then the third case is called SC, and this uh, was a challenge to the limit, the two child limit for tax credits. This was basically a human rights challenge. Um, it was established fairly early on uh, that the measure discriminated against women and so was, un, uh, was contrary to Article 14 of the European Convention. The question for the court though, or the, the controversial question, was whether that discrimination was permissible. And in deciding whether it was permissible, what standard or legal test should be applied? So going then to our three themes, the first, deference to the executive. Being a uh, beggar, sorry, is perhaps the, the most uh, extreme version of this. Um, because it, it is essentially concerns deference to the executive's claim of national security. Um, it was agreed by all the parties that Begum couldn't have a fair hearing when she was in the, uh, without a right to enter the UK. Um, and it was agreed that the security services had made an assessment of the threat she presented and said, well, anyone that was part of ISIS presents a threat, but didn't actually identify a specific threat uh, posed by Shamima Begum herself. The Court of Appeal um, applied a very traditional, uh, not traditional, a, a very standard um, realist analysis. Um, they said, well, this is a fundamental right, the right to a fair hearing, it's been breached, we all agree, so we've got to apply the proportionality standard that uh, Alex set out earlier. Is this necessary? Um, well, it could be, but is uh, and is the measure taken the the least intrusive uh, in, into the in, into the fundamental right? And uh, the court said, well, no, there are less intrusive measures that can be taken. For example, um, she could be allowed into the country but kept in detention. Um, the Supreme Court, however, said no, that's the wrong approach. This is a national security issue. And we have to defer to the government on all aspects of national security. So it's not just we defer to the security services assessment of the threat that was provided. We also have to defer to what the government wants to do about that threat. So it doesn't matter if the court thinks there is a, a less intrusive measure that could be taken. Um, we have to show deference. So we just have to accept what the government says as the uh, is, is is the the correct measure um freedom uh, the Fr friends of the earth uh, case um the question turned on what counts as government policy and the court of appeal said well that's not defined in the act it's not defined in any other case so we just have to use the ordinary meaning of the words and so we must ask ourselves well what has the government said is its policy on this? And that was actually, in this case, a relatively easy question to answer because two ministers had at um, different points, or they're close together, stood up in parliament and said, well, the government's policy in relation to the Paris Climate Accords uh, is, is to follow the Paris Climate Accords. Um, and the other sort of clue as to what government policy might be was the government signed the accords. And again, the court said, uh, the Supreme Court said, no, that's the wrong approach. We need, uh, it's unfair on the government to hold ministers to what they tell Parliament. Um, we need to defer to what ministers have said to this court is government policy. And for that reason, we need to define government policy very, very tightly in this act. Um, and they defined it as a formal written statement of policy akin to something like the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, and the result of this was to essentially define the test for government policy as a higher bar to clear than you would have to clear to establish a legitimate expectations challenge. So for legitimate expectations, you could be um, you can found that challenge on written or spoken words, but it's, it's got to be clear and unambiguous. Um, 
the courts defined the, the Planning Act test as higher than that, and it's not only got to be clear and unambiguous, but written down in a formal statement, except for in exceptional circumstances. Um, finally, uh, SC, um, and again, this, it was established pretty quickly uh, that the measure was discriminatory towards, towards women. Um, but and in this case, it was a it's a human rights question. So the court doesn't have discretion about uh, whether to impose a proportionality standard. It has to do the proportionality test because the Human Rights Act requires that in effect. Um, but instead of asking itself, is this the least invasive measure? The court applied a different standard to the last level of proportionality test. It applied, it asked itself, is this approach manifestly without reasonable foundation? And in doing so, it adopted a, it, it didn't bring this out of nowhere, it adopted a, a test that had been used by the European Court of Human Rights. And, and it said, well, this is because this is in the field of social policy, uh, because there's a large margin of appreciation, uh, we reflect that large margin of appreciation uh, by using the manifestly without reasonable foundation test. Um, but it's the, the Court of Human Rights has since said, actually, that's not the right way to go about this. What we meant when we talked about margin of appreciation was that this court, the Strasbourg Court, must give domestic courts a margin of appreciation in areas like social policy because they are the people on the ground, so to speak. So we are going to apply the manifestly without reasonable foundation test to the reasoning of domestic courts. In SC, the Supreme Court took that test that the international courts applying to domestic courts and used it as a domestic court for uh, analyzing an administrative decision by the executive. Um, and in effect, they, the, the effect of this is to essentially make the proportionality test much the same as the reasonability test, because one has to have make a really, really absurd decision uh, for it to be uh, deemed manifestly without reasonable foundation. So that, but that wasn't the end of SC. Having reached this conclusion and essentially decided the case, Lord Reed then took another step. And if we can go over the page, he spent some time discussing why it was a bad thing uh, that cases like SC should be brought at all. Um, and I've put what he said uh, up on the slides. There's no need for me to read it out. Um, save to point out that this reflects what government policy was at the time. And this reflects the talking points that were being um, uh, distributed by the government. Now, I'm sure that Lord Reed was not explicitly intending to do that, um, but it again shows a degree of deference towards the government in not just uh, government decision making, but the government's view of the role of the courts. Um, turning then to my next theme, which is the viewing Parliament rather than the courts as the ultimate guardian of the constitution and rights. The, uh, prior to the Reed Court, the, uh, the Apex Court, whether that's the House of Lords or the, um, uh, the Supreme Court, had uh, reached a view of the constitution where Parliament's uh, authority flowed from its democratic mandate. And this, it was set out in Jackson but, and set up very powerfully in Miller II. Um, as part of that, uh, it saw its role as protecting the fundamental rights necessary to make democracy function. And so it didn't see rights as in conflict with democracy, but as an essential part of democracy. And over the page, Lady Hale explains why that, that is in a case called Guyton and Godin Mendoza. Um, so the, the court's starting point was always, how do we, what, what's necessary to preserve uh, democracy and democratic rights? Um, and 
hopefully you've all uh, um, you, you've all got that um, on 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 the slides. Uh, can we just go over the slide to uh, um, go to Mendoza? Hopefully, this that's a quite a long section, so I'm not going to um, I'm not not going to spend any time on it. But it's 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 there. And the slides can be distributed afterwards, um, and so you can see Lady Hale's reasoning. Um, if we go over the slide again, we see in Begum, uh, Friends of the Earth, and SC, the Reed Court rowing back from this approach. Um, in Begum, uh, what flowed from the, uh, and that, the reasoning uh, of the need for greater deference to the executive, not to Parliament, to the executive, um, the, even though it was a fundamental rights case, and in fact, even Lord Reed himself, when he was a member of the Hale Court in the Unison case, had said where fundamental rights are at stake, the appropriate test is proportionality. Um, in Begum, the Reed Court rode back from that and said, because we have to show deference, the appropriate test is Wensbury unreasonableness. Um, in Friends of the Earth, the what's notable about it is not simply the decision, which I, I've already uh, discussed, but Lord Hodge, who gave the um, leading judgment, the way he reached that decision. And his entire argument uh, adopts only the perspective of the executive. Um, and he essentially said it would, be, it would be really inconvenient for the executive if civil servants had to look through Hansard um, and the public statements of their ministers um, in order to take them into account. And that, you know, that would make life difficult for civil servants. So it's unfair to impose that, uh, that rule on them. Um, and that for Hodge, for Lord Hodge, was enough to justify this very, very tight view of um, uh, minister of a uh, government policy, and essentially defining government policy as something other than what the government said it's going to do. Uh, in SC, it was a slightly different case because it's a human rights case, not just a, a, a common law fundamental rights case. Um, the in his reasoning, Lord Reed acknowledged that the court's position in the Constitution, um, being able to determine these cases, only existed at the gift of Parliament, and said, um, essentially, if the court goes too far um, in, in challenging um, the executive, then the executive and Parliament uh, might take away this, uh, the court's uh, ability to adjudicate on, on fundamental rights. Um, and I've just put another clip, another little excerpt from his judgment on the, over the next page. Uh, and I think it's important to note what he say, says as how he describes enforcing rights in the social uh, policy sphere, even when these are rights that are um, recognized in, in the ECHR or even in common law um, as, as interfering in politics. And this contrasts with what Hale said, Lady Hale and Guyton goes in Mendoza, which viewed fundamental rights as actually prior to politics and sort of setting the rules of the game in which politics must be played. I'd like to wrap up um, by looking at international law quite briefly, so we leave some time for questions. Um, now, why would you be interested in what the court says about uh, international law? Um, well, not because it's uh, any, any of us are trotting off to, perhaps, perhaps many of you are trotting off to the International Court of Justice in the, in the next few weeks, but uh, unfortunately I'm not. Um, the reason it's significant is that international standards have, uh, prior to the Reed Court, been seen as an aid to the interpretation of domestic law. Um, and while international law cannot be incorporated into domestic law without an act of parliament, uh, there was a strong presumption, and this comes from a case called the Crown and Lions, um, there was a strong presumption that neither parliament 
nor the executive intended to act in a manner contrary to international law, unless they explicitly said so. Now in Begum, uh, the court had the benefit of an intervention from the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights. Um, and the rapporteur pointed out uh, that there are international legal instruments to, to, uh, governing the deprivation of citizenship, uh, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the UK is a signatory to both. But also there is a requirement from something called customary international law. And that's like the, in, the, the common law of international law. And it's, it was previously established in a UK case called KU that customary international law, unlike treaties, is directly applicable. Um, now, the, the reason this was important is because uh, the combination of these, these various different instruments and, uh, and the customary international law norm imposed a procedural requirement for the deprivation of citizenship. And that was, if you're gonna take someone's nationality away, you have to go and get a written statement from their alternative state. And the, in this case, uh, with Begum, it was Bangladesh. Um, and the rapporteur explained this to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court's judgment in Begum just says, we thought very carefully about all of the interventions. One sentence. It doesn't mention the rapporteur specifically at all, and it doesn't grapple with any of the arguments made. Uh, in Friends of the Earth, the court went further because it might be argued that in signing up to the Paris Agreement, the government had made a clear written statement of policy. And so it fell within even the, the much higher test imposed by the Supreme Court. But the court uh, said, actually, ratification is an act on the international plane, um, even though ratification does actually take place uh, domestically. Um, and so because international law can't bind without an act of parliament, um, neither can an act on the international plane. So what it did, what was done here is, is it, it took the existing dualist approach where an international treaty doesn't have direct effect unless incorporated by an act of parliament, and said even where uh, that also applies to statements of policy applied uh, on the international plane. And then in SC, um, the, uh, the claimants in this case relied on a previous quite case quite confusingly called SG, um, which had been a, a, an Article 14 case, just as SC was. And uh, Lady Hale had, re uh, had uh, relied on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child um, as an aid to the interpretation of Article 14. Um, and this was a standard approach uh, because the Convention on the Rights of the Child couldn't apply directly, but it must be assumed that in passing the Human Rights Act, uh, Parliament did not intend to act contrary to that, that convention. Um, and in SC, uh, the Reed Court reversed that approach and said that, uh, the, that approach is effectively incorporating international law by the back door. And uh, so we shouldn't even be taking account of it as an aid to interpretation. So why is this change in approach significance? Well, firstly, what the Supreme Court does influences what all the courts below us do. And so what we're likely to see, even in the, even going right down to, you know, Section 204 cases, uh, a greater deference to discretion. Uh, and this is, if we can just go over the slide, thank you, a less tolerance for public interest claims, fundamental rights no longer seen as sort of trump cards. And in things like housing and benefits cases, where, uh, where you have to take the um, interests of children uh, and, and there's, there's statutory duties to take the, the best interests of children into account. Um, the international conventions are, are no longer going to be relevant to the interpretation of those interests. And then in, in things like planning cases, um, things like climate change commitments are unlikely to be relevant insofar as they are on the international plane. Um, 
Although I would say that is for now, and please keep on your edge of the, your seats uh, for Finch and the Supreme Court, which is coming up in a few weeks, and also for Europe the um, European Court of Human Rights uh, decisions on whether Article 8 includes a right to a clean and healthy environment. But we don't have those, uh, those decisions yet. So for now, climate change is off the table. Uh, uh, international climate change commitments are off the table uh, for domestic decisions. That brings me to the end of my, uh, uh, my, my brief, brief remarks, probably not as brief as, as, as might have been desired, um, but uh, I'll hand it back to Colgett. Thank you very much both to you, Sam, and to you, Alex, for some very informative um, discussion there. I'm going to come back to you both in a moment with, um, to ask you for your final concluding thoughts and to pick up anything in the Q&A or in the questions that have been emailed to us. But before I do, perhaps I could just deal with four themes that have come out of what we've covered today. And um, they're on the slide there, but you'll have seen, no doubt, that there have been over the years an increasing tendency for public interest groups to get involved in litigation, either on behalf of individuals or by funding litigation in the background where you have a front man or front woman as the uh, claimant or the applicant. And very often they're groups that have tried to establish the unlawfulness of government policy um, and have lobbied against that policy as something's been going through Parliament, often unsuccessfully, and then have tried again, a second bite of the cherry, through litigation. And it's, it's interesting to note that there seems to be a discouragement of that um, involvement. And back in 2018, Lord Reid denied permission to the statutory body called the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission to become a litigator in an important case on abortion. And you'd think that um, of all the bodies that might be involved and have an interest in that sort of litigation, it would be a body such as the Human Rights Commission, but they were denied uh, involvement. And um, similar um, decisions have been made in relation to the Good Law Project, for example. Last year, they were um, they brought a case along with the Running Mead Trust in relation to the appointment of the chief executive of the Test and Trace programme. And um, their involvement was closed down by the court and they were um, penalised with cost orders. And uh, so there seems to be a trend towards discouraging that public interest um, litigation by groups representing um, uh, uh, claimants as opposed to individual claimants bringing the cases themselves. Um, th there's also the trend that um, Sam talked about in terms of background documents. So they might be trawling parliamentary debates or they might be um, other examples of our international uh, obligations and the reliance on those uh, external documents that aren't directly relevant to the legislation at hand seems to be something that's being discouraged uh, by the courts. And that's also one of the themes that seems to be emerging from uh, the Reed Court. You've heard about the international law and the um, lesser rele relevance of it, it would seem, uh, in the current climate of the uh, current makeup of the court. And it, it seems to be a case that the, the views taken that international law and domestic law operate in independent spheres, and that treaties that we've signed up to aren't legislation unless Parliament has chosen to treat them as such. An example would be the European Convention on Human Rights and it having been, um, if in effect, incorporated through the Human Rights Act. And then finally, there's a question over the standard of review, particularly in cases where, which touch on social and economic policy and whether by having a standard which requires something to be manifestly without reasonable foundation, it actually makes it very difficult to establish that there is any uh, uh, illegality or problem with the uh, measurement question. And whether by having that sort of test, we're insulating the decision maker from effective review, again, um, uh, diluting the ability of the courts to hold the executive uh, to account. So all um, themes to, to note as we move forward with uh, Lord Reid's presidency of the court and um, areas to watch. I'm going to, um, before we close the seminar, invite both Alex and uh, Sam in turn to offer any closing thoughts. Um, I'm going to come to you, Alex, first. Thanks, Claudette. Um... What I will do, if I may, actually, just in deference to, to those who've asked questions on the Q&A, um, is take one of those questions um, just briefly 
I appreciate we're, we're at an hour and, and attendance is dwindling a bit, but there's one question in particular that um, uh, I, I wanted to answer, given that I have a, a, something of a, a tragic interest in this case, because I spent a number of years uh, researching this issue when I was in academia. Uh, the question is, are we likely to see more references to Strasbourg uh, where private organisations breach human rights? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, we might, uh, but we have to be careful uh, to think that this is an opening of the floodgates. So it, it isn't, in my view. The scheme of the convention is that it was drafted uh, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, and it was very much focused on protecting the individual against state behaviour. Um, a lot of the convention rights are drafted in a way that appears to suggest they apply to the state. Uh, qualified rights are often drafted in a way that the qualifications only apply to the state. And so it is generally, I think, going to be difficult to persuade courts, um, uh, particularly the European court, uh, that it should intervene in the case of a, a, a breaching of human rights by a private organisation. Um, there are situations where it happens, um, uh, but it happens rarely. Um, and it happens because the organisation is private, but nevertheless, the circumstances are such that the state uh, Strasbourg field should have intervened. Um, and that explains a lot of, for instance, the privacy cases uh, where there's media intrusion into the private lives, perhaps, of celebrities, to give one example. Um, in those cases, Strasbourg sometimes does impose an obligation on the state uh, to make sure that it's protecting the right to privacy. Um, but that is, uh, it, it seems, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, crucially, Strasbourg isn't saying in that situation uh, that a, a, a journalist or a, a media outlet is, in fact, a public authority or a governmental organisation. Uh, and that the government is directly responsible for it. Um, and in fact, the case law, in my view, I'm not sure it's a view held by, by all, but in my view, the case law on state responsibility in Strasbourg, uh, when analysed properly, suggests that Strasbourg actually has an even stricter approach to what the state is, uh, an even narrower view of that uh, than the domestic courts do uh, of what a public authority is. So quite a long-winded answer. Uh, I apologise. Um, I've hijacked the uh, closing remarks section. Um, but, but it is an interesting question, I think. Um, uh, so the answer is yes, I think we might see more cases, but, but there'll be those limited cases um, of indirect state responsibility, in my view. I'll, I'll do the same thing and take, the, take the other, uh, one of the other questions, um, which is uh, about the, the ver various bills uh, going, going through the, the commons or proposed that are uh, problematic from a human rights law perspective. And, uh, are we likely to see the Supreme Court striking uh, some of them uh, down? I think the answer is very much no. Um, firstly, the Supreme Court can't strike down primary legislation, but I think it's e it's very unlikely to even do what it legally can do, which is to issue a declaration of incompatibility um, or interpret it in a interpret the legislation in a in a compatible manner. Um, I, th I, I think the court is very much likely to uh, to defer to, to Parliament, even when that is problematic for human rights. Moreover, I think the court is more likely to be um, uh, to be deferential in relation to secondary legislation, which it can uh, rule as unlawful, um, and where because that's part of that is legislation made by the government uh, with the permission of Parliament, not by Parliament. Um, I think the the court is is likely to defer to the executive on the secondary legislation, particularly in the area of uh, you know social policy, um, uh, rather than uh, even even when it uh, is it runs into conflict with uh, with fundamental rights, whether these are common law or uh, European human rights. Thank you both to Sam and to Alex for those informative talks. Um, thank you to everybody that's joined us today. As I mentioned at the outset, this event has been recorded. And so if you haven't been able to stay till the end or miss the beginning, you'll be able to view this at your leisure, along with any of the other uh, public law team events that uh, are of interest to you. Of, to you. You'll see on the um, website that there's also the ability to access other resources, including previous webinars that we've undertaken, and the slides for today will be made available on the website as well. Um, so thank you for attending. We're always interested in knowing um, what else you'd like us to talk about, this being our first public law event. So do email us if there are other events or other topics that you'd like us to be organising or covering, 
Uh, we always welcome those suggestions as well as any other feedback that you've got in relation to today's webinar. Uh, please do have a look at our website because in addition to the previous events, you'll see details of forthcoming events and the ability to sign up to things like our team newsletters, should that be something that's of interest to you. But for now, thank you very much.